panel for, for quite some time now. He was um, first my supervisor at the Minnesota Institute for Social and Health Sciences. Just as a so, sorry, can, can you use a mic, please? Sorry? Can you use a mic, please, for the camera purposes? Thank you. Um, I was, I was, is that better? That's fine. Okay. I was Kopanu's <laughs> intern first, and he then became my supervisor for my PhD. And I've been waiting a long time, a long moment for this, uh, to actually have my, my say, because I've processed a lot that, is, <laughs> that, is, that, is, that has happened. No, no, it's nothing bad. It was, I remember in one of our staff meetings, um, Kopano, you said, um, Yasin bugs me. I don't know if you remember this. He bugs me. He comes to my office and he just waits there. He bugs me, right? Um, but that was the way things actually get done. And you then went on to say, I want to be famous. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? I'm tired of being hidden. I'm, I'm tired of being hidden. Um, this was about probably 10 years ago. And I can, as, as a former student and um, you know, someone who was supervised by you, who takes you as a mentor, I can say that your discourse has started spreading. Um, it has. And it's permeating academia and, and the world beyond. So even beyond you, Kopano, your discourse is going to evolve into something that even you have not thought about. So you're going to be famous for a very long time. All right? And I know I sound as though I'm in love with Kopano, but I am. That's good. Um, he's just got the most entertaining way of, of bringing, and he's got a very nice way of, of, of intellectualizing and presenting very complex topics. Um, so without any further ado, the Professor Kopano Ratele. This has been the, <clears throat> the nicest introduction I've had. <laughs> I, I have a problem with fame, actually. I have a, a huge problem. Uh, thank God I'm, I'm not famous. Thank you, Andre and uh, Yasin and students and teachers for being here. Appreciate it, Andre. Uh, short time to be here. I always drive through P. I just realized, um, but I have friends here. Barbara Swartz is uh, Derek Swartz's sister, the friend who comes from here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, I, I'm not friend. Derek or Barbara's a friend. Uh, um, this is how I want to start, and I am guessing the majority of people in here are students, which I really appreciate. So I'm gonna start this way. I wanna ask you a question. You don't have to answer. But who knows, I might take a, a grade afterwards. Yes. Under what conditions would you consider a thesis or a research report? Third year, fourth year, master's thesis, a doctoral dissertation, excellent. If it only, or even mainly, cites US authorities. Under what conditions would you consider a research report, a thesis, a dissertation excellent if it only or mainly cites the authorities? Freud? Carl Jung, B.F. Skinner, Bandura, oh yeah, you have to do Bandura. <laughs> you have to do Bandura. <coughs> Carl Rogers, if you are a therapist, the humanist therapist. Uh, CBT is a big thing for, for clinical psychologists. You name them. Now keep this in mind. See, like most teachers in here, researchers, I read a lot of theses and dissertations. I tend to lately just say, okay, three, four is about enough for a year. Uh, but some I read, not to examine, uh, but to keep up with what uh, students are doing. You have to keep up uh, new kinds of work, uh, new topics that have not been researched. You wanna keep up with that. And my impression is this. It's an impressionistic 
sentiment. My impression is the majority of theses that I read from South African students that I examine, but also that I read, um, particularly now on African psychology uh, and on gender and on rape, but I have all the theses on masculinity from wherever, from all of the universities. I always pick them up, put them in a, in a kind of bibliography. I think most of them are adequate. In fact, they're more than adequate. They're more than satisfactory at the level of master and doctorate. I even think they're more than, more than that. They're more than just satisfactory when compared to some of the works that I read from the countries that I'm more familiar with, where I visit as a researcher and a teacher. Finland, Sweden, Holland, the Netherlands, and a little bit of you know, the, the United Kingdom and, and the US, but these are the, the first three in particular. But because, and this is a critical concept, because of colonial inferiorization of generally intellectual work from Africa, from South Africa, um, from universities such as this one, UCT, UNISA, Fort Hare, and other universities, University of Ghana, Gondar University, Bandar, so all, all around the university that I'm familiar with. Um, both we as teachers, but also students, because we transmit this to students, often fail to recognize the warped and alienating standards we have set for ourselves. And they start with English, by the way, right? So students are marked for English and thinking. Colonial inferiorization is generated by forces of colonial alienation of the body that, tag, that gets tagged as other, as a slave body, as an inferior body, as black, because the black is the slave, right? black becomes the slave, as the body below the university, as uh, Tanehisa Coates writes about in a different context. So let me spend a little time about this idea of alienation. Alienation. Now there are many, many scholars who have written about this in sociology, political science, <clears throat> and a little bit in psychology. Max, Eric Fromm, Franz Fanon, of course, Steve Pico wrote about this alienation, this idea of alienation. Here's a basic definition. The act of estranging or state of estrangement in feeling or affection. Loss of mental faculties. The act and I like this one, the act of transferring, it's, a, it's an economic one, the act of transferring ownership of anything. Diversion of something to a different purpose. So one is alienated. When you say one is alienated, you mean, I mean, he or she is estranged from his or her emotion or thoughts. The body seems to be controlled by other forces. You don't quite show, but you know, one of the big forces is capital, right? Capital is the biggest force. You think you like the shirt, you think the desire is original, but the desire actually comes from elsewhere, from the advertisers. You go to Zara, you think, I have to have this shirt. <laughs> but the shirt has been sent to you by advertisers. So the label becomes your own desire, but the desire is not original. So your project, your project, your purpose is not really your own. In alienation exercise, Franz Fanon, quite a lot. Uh, in a book that is not as widely read as it should be, called Toward the African Revolution, 
his political essays. This is what he has, this is what Fanon says. But he starts by saying, having witnessed the liquidation of its systems of reference, the collapse of its cultural patterns, the native can only recognize with the occupant that God is not on his side. He might as well have said, God is dead. You remember, the postmodernist will say this later. God is not on his side. The oppressor, and he goes on to say this. And he ends by saying, and these words that I have underlined are quite important. A pejorative judgment with respect to its original forms of existing. New ways of seeing. So you don't see with your own eyes. You see with the other eyes that have been given to you. You speak in a particular way, but this speech has been given to you. The event which is commonly designated as, as alienation is naturally very important. It is found in the official text under another name. And in a different context, I will speak about this, particularly about universities, which I, I'm thinking quite a, a lot. This name is called assimilation. At least in the French colonies, this word assimilation. So in South Africa, when we talk about transformation, most time we talk about assimilation. The structures exist, you assimilate new bodies into that structure. What does alienation do? Alienation distorts our vision. It infects our existence. It induces us to disapprove of ourselves, to regard our ways of living, or your mother's ways, your grandmother's ways, as inferior. You now see them as inferior when compared to these other ways that you've been sold. And you talk about them in depreciatory terms. You don't even see when you're doing this, quite a lot. Right? You go back to the village where you were born, but somehow you think you're a, you're a superior being because you speak in a particular way, because you dress in a particular way. Mm -hmm. We are not who we think we are. We are puppets like Chester Missing. Mm -hmm. We think we're in control, but we're merely carrying out orders, possibly unwittingly. Someone else who has something to say about alienation is Steve Beagle. And in court, May 1976, under cross-examination, this is what he has to say. He's making a connection between alienation with the philosophy of black consciousness. And he's been led, actually, under examination by, the, by his lawyer. This is the trial of the South African Student Organization and the Black People's Convention. And he starts by saying, and you can see up there, he starts by saying, I think basically black consciousness refers itself to the black man. The feminists, the gender critical scholars here, this is Biko, we know, we've criticized him. There's a, a bit of work he needed to have done. He refers to himself to the black man and to his situation, and I think the black man is subjected to two forces in this country. He's first of all oppressed by an external world through institutional machinery, through laws um, that restrict him from doing certain things, through heavy work conditions, through poor pay, through very difficult living conditions, and you know, these things still exist. Through education, he mentions education. These things are external, they alienate you. This force is alienate you. I've been speaking about capital quite a bit. And then secondly, he comes to this. He comes to the psychological bits about this. So what is Bigo saying? Bigo is pointing us to two things that a university needs to do, that a department needs to do. To deal with inferiority and alienation, you have to do, you have to address yourself to the structural forces, how a department is organized, who teaches, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's addressing itself to the education, the curriculum, or at least the form of the curriculum, to the policies of an institution. I mean, right now, one of the biggest struggles in universities is around rape, right? Sexual harassment, rape, me too. <laughs> this, this policies, you need these policies. You need them to be strong. To the living conditions at residences of students. University of Zululand, for instance. Quite appalling. Mm. Devon University of Technology, quite appalling. Mm. You need to address yourself to this, these things. Um, some of the stuff you can address. Of course, Bigo is also talking about laws. You can't address this, but as I said, you can address education that you give to students. You can address policies of sexism and racism. 
But second, Biko has talked about the second thing. He says, and this is obviously something psychologists can do. You don't have to be in a psychologist though to do this. You have to start teaching this. As Biko says right at the bottom there. You have to find a way to uncouple goodness from whiteness. Excellence has to be uncoupled from whiteness. Even in, in universities and departments where the majority of people are black, you still have this coupling of Europe and America with excellence. That's basically what you need to do. You need to say, you need to uncouple this Manichian thing of heterosexuality is good, queerness is bad. You have to, uh, I spoke about America is better, Africa needs work. So we need to change at the level of affect, cognitions, thinking. I also like what the British social psychologist Ian Parker has to say about alienation. He wrote something along these lines. He says, alienation is not merely the separation of yourself from other people. Right? So by this he means that when people are, are, are protesting somewhere else for living conditions, you say, this is not my stuff. This is not my stuff. When, when women are protesting around rape at, at roads, he says, no, I'm a man. This is not. So it refuses this idea of solidarity. Alienation does this. But Ian Parker says it's not only about that. It's also a kind of separation from ourselves in which we experience ourselves as inhabited and driven by forces that are mysterious to us. What are these forces? These mysterious forces include economic structures that we are beings that must sell our labor to others. Capital is the biggest one. But racism is part of this, right? Racism makes some people not, not sympathize with others. Sexism makes that, that you don't sympathize with the injurability of women. Racism with the injurability of black bodies. So you start having a hierarchy of that if it's a, a little white child with blue eyes, if they get shot, whoa, the world stops. But if it's a, a black man, black men are tougher. Really? It's the, the US is in that the, the, the Black Lives Matter is about that, that the injurability of the black body, of the black male body in particular. But you don't see it as quite clear. You see it in the structures how the minister, the new minister of the police, and this is, a, this is a both contentious but a critical point. The minister of police, the first thing, one of the first things he says on TV, he says, we're going to work on, on, on keeping women and, and children safe. He's right, of course. But he forgets that out of the 19,000 people who died in the country, black men and colored men, 80 to 90%, the data that I work every day. So the problem we face in the country is seeing the black male perpetrator as also the victim. It's a very difficult thing to do this, to, to start to think critically about gender, about, and tomorrow I speak about, about that in particular, about, well, this is a different context, but I said, why do black men violate the very people who were violated with them? This is, a, this is a key question. So let me move on. It is my belief that existentially rewarding interest in both psychology and Africa cannot be at home in Africa without troubling itself with globally hegemonic traditions of knowledge and knowing and being. This tradition into which we, here, on this campus, across Africa, are hailed into as students, as teachers, as researchers. Because when you enter university, the moment you enter the university, you are being interpolated. You are being brought into certain traditions of thinking about the world. You can't avoid it. To pass, you have to show that you have mastered this tradition. So one cannot be completely at ease. You cannot be at home in your studies as a university teacher, as a researcher, even as a student. When you have this little nagging feeling this thing doesn't work. This thing doesn't explain my life. You're about to touch it because you realize that Africa, that your life in Africa, this place called Africa, doesn't feature in psychology textbooks. It doesn't. Until 
the Asim comes up and writes a textbook. <laughs> That's it. That is, Africa is a nebulous, a hazy, an unreal character, figuration in the discipline of psychology. But you can neither, neither can such an interest in psychology and Africa be at ease in America. Well, maybe America is a different, but you are talking about EPSI, what's called the Association of Black Psychologists. It's a small body of work right there in America. So it's a, it's a marginal. The mainstream doesn't have this figuration of the black body, the black female body, the black male body, the black queer body. It doesn't have that at the center of, of the discipline. So you are forced to make a choice. You're forced, your consciousness is to make a choice. You either, like me, 14 years, you run away from psychology. So that something is not working out very well. <coughs> or you have to live with this alienation. You know stuff, but it sits somewhere, somewhere in a portion of your head. It doesn't sit right at the center. So that's why the project then, of when you come back, you want to develop this kind of African-centered, decolonizing, gender-critical, feminist psychology for the world. Conscious of your situatedness in a bigger world, right? And every psychology student researcher who teaches, who learns, who researches, who is interested in this is a, is a, a tricky concept, which I might not be able to, to talk about. We can talk about it. Authentic living and relationships, authentic being. If you are situating yourself this, you can contribute and, and all of us can benefit benefit from this. This, by authentic, I mean a de-alienated at the simplest level. That you have worked against alienation, uh, you have found a meaningfulness in life. <coughs> I could go on and talk a, a, a lot more about what alienation does. That it divides us from others, that this division can be on any basis, but mostly in this country, it's based on race, right? And gender, and capital. Three things, of course. There are other kinds of divisions. Uh, but it can be based on accent. This division can be based on accents. <laughs> it's a simple thing like how you speak, how you, you, you know, so people who are hired speak in a particular way for a long time. When SAFM changed and started having other accents in South Africa, oh, there was an uproar. <laughs> so we can't hear these people. In UCT right now, if you're talking to students, they will tell about the experience that the black engineering lecturers Students say they, they can't hear them. But the German, East German accents, they hear them very well. <laughs> what is this, this about? <laughs> so there's a, there's a thing right there. There's a thing right there that alienates, that separates you from other people and not feel, feel I don't know why, why you want to feel sympathy, but these are different accents. This is a different accent. So coloni colo colonization, colonialism, coloniality centers on the black body, which is then saying racialization and racialization is woven into economic control. And the greatest achievement then of colonial nation is, is getting us to think in particular ways about our bodies, about the world. That's the greatest achievement. Um, and that way of thinking is inextricably linked to how we think about ourselves and about others. And you have to think about this. We are our bodies, right? Our bodies are us. We are our bodies. We are as much as our minds as our bodies. So the body is not separate from. So the way you start to think about the body, the, your mind thinks about the body, the body relates to the mind. This has been given to you in particular ways. So what does this all mean? It means this. It means we have to return. We have to learn in, in classes. We have to learn as teachers, how to see clearly again, how to see ourselves clearly. This is a hard task. It's a hard task. It's a hard task. One must learn how to teach to be whole again. When, I, when you're supervising students, you have to learn something that nobody taught you about, probably at university, how to care for students. Caring is not part of, the, of this ethic that we're taught about. So you have to learn to do this sort of stuff. You have to, because you have to learn to critically understand how alienation makes you see in particular ways. So you get re-educated to become conscious about where one is standing as you look at the world. You see it in television, in films, uh, in cultural work, uh, and then you start to, to learn to reinterpret in different ways. So African psychology, 
the way I'm thinking about it. Perhaps I should be more specific, because African psychology is all psychology in Africa, all of it. All of it, right? It's not a, it's not a corner of psychology. All psychology done in Africa is African psychology. Nominally, nominally. And under that, then, you have to start cutting it up. The greatest field in that is, is a psychology that's oriented towards Europe. The greatest field in that is oriented towards Europe. And there's a small corners of this African psychology, what you might then call properly African-centered psychology, uh, is, is trying to write things. But African psychology as a whole is an upside down state it, because the bulk of that psychology is alienating. Uh, it is part of the process of alienation. It cuts us off from our experiential life uh, and cuts off those who need it most uh, from, from itself. And this is what has to be reconfigured in classes, in a decolonizing psychology, which starts to be de-alienating. So this small part, a number of people have been trying this for a while. About, so how do you do this? If psychology is an upside down state, it puts Europe at the center, while it's still being taught at a university in Africa. How do you write this balance? How do you write it so that you can teach Europe, but you teach it from here? Right? You can teach for it, but you have to find to teach it here. Um, so not only teach, not only students, but teachers, us as teachers, as researchers, are estranged by this Euro-American psychology from our true cares. As simple as very few of us speak in our original voice. You, you can't speak in your original voice, metaphorically, but also in real terms. You can't speak. One article attempts to do this after so long. One article, in that article tries to write psychology in Sichuan. One article. Because it's a, it's a very difficult thing to, but you can think about it, I, I guess, in other disciplines, right? Political science, how do you attempt to do this, to write philosophy? And, and philosophy has been done, to write it in, in particular. And these are also debates that are quite important, I guess, to entertain. So especially when they arrive at universities, so psychology students are taught to rely excessively on authorities who are usually somewhere in the US, in Europe, they are induced to forget their own inborn voice and creativity and why they wanted to do psychology in the first place. And one of the things the students always say, I want to help people. I always say that. But if you want to be a clinical psychologist, actually, you're not going to help people. You're going to help a person, one person. And they're going to give you 650 for 50 minutes or something like that, right? If you're a counseling psychologist, but even researchers, you start not quite not quite uh, doing work that engages communities. Other people have been trying this, of course, to a greater or lesser success. So because teachers have transferred the ownership of how to understand the mental and emotional lives around them to the authorities. Did, I, did you hear this, right? We have transferred the way of understanding someone to the authorities. The authorities are Freud, right? Freud was great, but those short stories really, Freud writes those short stories. Those short stories are great. But somehow you forget to interpose yourself between Freud and, this, and the life that, that you see right here. Um, so many teachers, but, not, but also therapists, are therefore not authors of their own explanations. We are not authors of our own explanations. We mimic how authorities explain the contents of the mind and emotions and relationships. We teach the same ability for mimicry. This is post-colonial theory, right, that taught us this. Uh, Homi Baba, quite a wonderfully while back, taught us about this mimicry. Uh, rather than coming up with <coughs> sound, lived experience, contextually bound explanation to our students. So you can see why it is ne nothing less than, than regaining one's mental faculties, literally. It's about regaining your mental faculties uh, and, and, and helping students to regain their, their, how they account, in how they account about the psyche, about emotion, about memory, in trying to do this thing called African-centered psychology. Now, I've been told quite an interesting thing, because I want to stop quite soon so we can talk, that different universities do this differently. And I prefer the second, the second way of doing it. Um, that you can have a course called African Psychology 101. And one or two, right? Other people do it this way. University of Kwazulu Natal does it this way. Right? 
uh, and I think University of Tanzania, and maybe University of Ghana. Uh, and I hear NMU has that. So you have a course that focuses on that. Or you can have it in a different way, which is what I, I prefer. But some people have said, made a rejoin, why don't you do both? It's like gender mainstreaming. You can have a desk at a, in the department, or you can mainstream it, right? So I say, well, you have to think of a way of mainstreaming African psychology. You have to start to think about who is at the center of the curriculum. Yep, it's a hard, it's much harder work. It's so hard. I must give you a, a quick example. I, I, you know, I, I like writing textbooks, but I haven't written one in a long time. So one of the textbook writers says, come. OK, come and write a, an African social psychology book for us. Uh, I say, whoa. There's, there's a couple of ways to do this, right? You can do examples and then slot in the theory. Right. That's, what, that's, that's the easiest one. I don't want to do that. I want one that starts, that starts with live experience. And if each chapter should be, should be African-centered in itself. I don't know how to do this. I am practicing how to do this. But it's taking me a while. It needs a collective of us to help each other how, how you write a book like this. But what, what I mean is, a textbook in psychology, I don't know whether you've seen this, in, in psychology, we have 14 topics. We know them all, right? Learning, emotion, consciousness, biology, research methods, and so on. Right. And you go to third year, all of them. So this is a standard time. This is what I mean. And you have to plug in then the experience at the best of Africa, somewhere there. So, okay. There's a study from, from the Kbele in Benin, they do this. Study from Zuelicha, they do this, right? You're plugging it in right there. Or you could start, no, 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 no. Here are the important topics about that we must study psychologically from here. That's a much harder task. Um, I'm going to stop here rather than go into the second aspect about what, where I started. But I'm going to say it very quickly. So what I'm going to stop is, is, to, is to say, well, this idea of, about inferiorization, that what you do is not good enough, uh, what comes from Africa, intellectual thought from Africa, is internalized by, by blacks and whites, by the way. This must be clear. But white people and black people, it's not about black people, or both of us. In South Africa, you are good if you go and do the Daily Show in New York. This is not, it doesn't say Trevor Noah is not good. He's good, but you don't recognize how good he is until he goes elsewhere. Same thing, film, uh, somebody's film has been shown this week or next week in Cannes, an African's film. But then we pick it up right now that this is a good film. We do this about all our cultural products, about all our knowledges. Right? We, we think when we go elsewhere, when we learned in Oxford and Yale, which are good schools, but somehow we never quite realize how, how brilliant this thing is because we do this. So, white and black in Africa, we find then here an instantiation of what the cross-cultural psychologist Harry Triandi said a long time ago about psychologists and students in Africa. Many of us, he said, many of them, he said, have an inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis, via -vis America and Western Europe. We said it that uh, African psychologists have an inferiority complex. Dissertations are considered good because they are associated with some external standards set in the West. It is, in fact, the idea of the West itself. That is the standard against which we measure the work itself. So it is not that a thing is good, although it comes from the West, but we act that it is good because it is from the West. You follow the logic? You don't say, no, this thing is good. It, it comes from the West, but it's good. But we know, no, no, the goodness comes first. Because it is white, it must be good. Because it's from the West, it must be good. And this is how we measure our work. Uh, so we have to come overcome these pervasive inferiority complexes. So this is then very briefly, the terrain in which I found this problem. It's a, it's a, it's a secondary problem, it's not the, the primary. The primary is, of course, we have to agree that this is important. The secondary is that then I find on my desk a, a recent example, a thesis, excellent thesis, PhD thesis. I thought the student had produced a fine scholarship. It was superbly crafted, 
was confidently written, was clear, well argued, and very much embedded in Western theory, in psychology, in feminist psychology. Admirably so. The candidate was obviously well read, quoting Foucault, Butler, Lacan, and many others. Was bringing psychoanalysis together with deconstruction, feminist post structuralism, uh, and post humanism, which is, is like, wow, this is like amazing. <laughs> and uh, thrown a bit, a bit of new materialism right there. Um, and, and performativity. And, well, it, was, it was just like a real, uh, I was learning such a lot. Uh, and he drew from this. So it was fantastically wonderful. But here's the thing then. This thesis was not critical. The critique itself was not critical about its own subjectification to the West. Are you following what I say? So it wasn't, it wasn't critical about not being located fully in its conditions of working with sex workers in Cape Town at Kenilworth. It wasn't doing that. Like, I'm here. It was telling me about this. So there was a, a certain thing, but how do you then, this is where I am, how would you, as a, as a teacher, as a student, how would you think about a thesis like that? Thank you. Thank you, Kopano, for what I'm sure the students and myself found to be quite fascinating and, and interesting and also thought-provoking. Um, I know as a lecturer, it's making me sit up and think about some of the, you know, the quotations I've asked my students to bring into their research and um, the missing references. And why are we filling it in with certain individuals or these authorities? Um, because I think the, what one of the messages that I take away from this is if you shift the power of the authority, then you shift the positionality that you assume um, in the production of knowledge. Um, and I think that is what we need to start doing as, as African psychologists, is shifting that power dynamic that has always dominated and told us what to do. It, it's kind of taking what we can and almost shifting the lens and doing things, as you said, from an African-centered way. Um, what I'm gonna do now, though, is maybe hand over to the Psych Society first and to see if there's any questions or comments that they would like to share. And then we'll open up to the audience. All right. Yeah. Our Psych Society students. Questions, comments, responses, yes, yeah. Um, okay, hi, I'm Junita. I'm part of the subcommittee for the Psych um, Society. Um, I actually have a question based on um, one of your six theses, theses on African psychology for the world. Um, I have a question on thesis one, where um, um, I think it's all of human psychology is African psychology. What I wanted to ask is, how can all human psychology be African psychology if human psychology in general has not taken the African perspective into consideration in terms of African culture? Because it's so broad. How, how do you incorporate that into it? Hi there, um, I'm Neil, also part of the Psych Society. I'm just wondering, we have all these theories that are Western, that are given to us in undergrad degree level, and like I said, most of them are Western, and you said that there's a, quite an obvious problem with that. How do we use that information in this kind of context? Um, does it form like a springboard for further investigation, <coughs> that this is a, what the Western side has done, and this is maybe something that the African side should look at? Or does it just show a complete reformation of the psychological discourse, but using that as a springboard for further inquiry. Thank you. Thank you. I think there was a question over here. Alco. Jesus. It's too close. I can shout. It's fine. No, we need you on. We need you on the camera. Should I stand here? Okay. I've got a question, Nakopa in terms of the, the curriculum of psych psychology. Okay, let me start here first. 
how do how how would you define the the character of African psychology just for the sake of students that are here you know because we still have students that are taught Vygotsky and all of those things nice things okay because we know that psychology is a product of culture you know and also how do we just for, for, for the sake of students that are here what would be the fundamental thing apart from uh, uh, yes you are saying that let's center ourselves what is it what is the basic that each and every student that has done psychology in Africa that should take out that one key thing for example in the in part of curriculum but also I just want to talk about the the the, the understanding if we're talking about African psychology the understanding of health in general in Africa how imbilo health as impilo that that is not just a psychological issue where impilo has to go uh, 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 and deal with the the, the spiritual mm -hmm. so how do, how do we how do we transform a secular psychology that does not even recognize spirituality yes. you know so and also it's very classist and white you know, because the culture in itself is classist, is white, and therefore very secular. So how do we begin to bring all of that to understand the African child? Because see, I pity Nasi Makruche in Moscow. We go to Ogogo when we've got problems. The fact that Umdom Nyama Kaningagi. Firstly, go. Let's just find out what is keeping. Do you get it? We don't go to the psychologist, but that is missing in the curriculum. But of course, we do have a, a, a mass of students, 500, 600 students in our classrooms. We know corporatized university, and therefore we give them multiple choice questions up to third year. You know. So these are the things that we have to talk about. You know. And, but but I, I would like you to to just to speak to one or two of those things. Then. <laughs> Thank you, Chen. Uh, Pedro is a student at the university. You know, Chen, one of the things I hardly mention to my colleagues and friends is that I actually majored in psychology. <laughs> <laughs> and many people don't know this because I don't talk about it. Because I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I majored in psychology and sociology, but whenever I was asked what I'm studying, no, I'm studying sociology. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I'm not proud of that nonsense. <laughs> and I was saying this to his law the other time. That the only time was I ever visited that floor in my entire three years was, was probably to submit that sick note or to... I, I can't even tell you who... who I don't I don't remember the names of those lecturers as well, you know, because you see then, this is where the problem is going to be when we transform the curricula. I'm not talking about local issues, you know, in, in this university. Firstly, they have a nonsensical policy there of only allowing a certain number of students to do honors and masters. And they only allow, to be honest, white students yes. to go up to master's level. Yes, yes. You see? And I'm, I'm not afraid to tell them. I tell them straight mm. that this is what you are doing here, and you are not going to go far mm. whilst you are still around. Because coming to what Professor Makotwane said, part of the things that also heal in our communities is your connection with your ancestors. Uh, because w when you go to the mountain, uh, comrades who are in the room, they know that guys who flout some of the rules there, uh, they end up having things not going well for them in life. Because of Utwage is meaning as flattered, because cross. We are now you can imagine finding that in a textbook <laughs> from that department forget it won't happen 
Yet it's a it, it's a critical spiritual concept of how we heal uh, as African people in our communities. So even at a structural level, just across the road in this building, they are here building seven. <laughs> They, they are, they are, they are, there's a mysterious flaw that they are in. They are driving an agenda of pushing out black students from doing postgrads. That is why you will never see a black lecturer in front of you doing psychology. And the way of teaching, it's multiple choice from first year to third year. If Capella was in the room, she would tell you. We had a question paper of 2013 being asked in 2015, the same thing. That's how we finished our, our qualification. Wow. <laughs> and you think we're going forward. Same. You know, so that's the mediocrity we're dealing with uh, in this institution uh, when it comes to that psychology department. And we must say these things as they are so that they can be fixed because the only language that uh, racism and coloniality listens to is the language of shaking the cage. You must shake the cage in this university for this uh, place to listen to you, you know. And when you speak your mind, they think that you are insane, yet you are speaking the truth because we have been growing accustomed to higher education institutions having the ability to deny the racism that they have within them. And when you speak about that thing, it's as if you are the one who's crazy, you know, I bet you. It's not like that. It's your assumption, you know. But the others are not seeing what you are seeing. You are too sensitive. Nonsense. Nonsense. So we must be able to name a spade a spade, and that is how things are going to change in university. We are where we are today because we shake the cage. We shake the lion in the cage, and we'll continue to do that for so long as we're here. And uh, we are going to pursue our academic endeavors. We are going to produce alternative knowledge of our people. Mm. And it is going to be the methodology for our students to study and be experts mm. in African and psych sociology, African psychology. We won't be tired. Mm. We will continue pushing until we reach the promised land. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Come other, you know, 
the interdisciplinary culture studies much later. This comes, you know, Stuart Hall and all of that, they come much later. But in that specific sense, there's a much different. What is psychology about? And why is this distinction between sociology and psychology really? What is the main thing? But it's because of a certain era where the disciplines were produced, and psychology takes a little part of it. That part that says, our study is about the psyche. Okay. What is the psyche thing? Uh, no, the, the other people say, this, we can't study the psyche. We're studying behavior. Other people say, no, that's a problem. You can't, you know, behavior doesn't tell you about what happens inside. And then much later, right now, the cognitive science revolution is, is back with us. That we study what happens inside the brain. And neuropsychology is part of that, right? Of cognitive science. The return of cognitive science. Psychologists are not agree like exactly what is the discipline about. We're not, we're not quite, quite agree. Uh, because you have this, all these chapters. Uh, psychologists study so, so individuals in society. There's people who study inside the brain. There's still some people who study behavior. Uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy comes a little bit out of it, right? The behavior, change the behavior, you will change that. And then there's the Freud, which has a little corner in psychology study. Okay, we study in something called the id, and the ego, and the super ego, and, and draws a few things, and tells stories about this. And it becomes quite uh, influential, right? That there is something in us that we don't see. It, it affects how, how we behave. But this starts in a certain era. But way before that, if you think way before that, you know, psychology really, in a general sense, the dictionary sense, if you will, is about how people think, feel about things. And in that sense, all, all psychologists, all psychologists, all human psychologists are in psychology, all in psychology. This is, what I, this is how I meant. And I'm saying, I'm assuming that you understand this, I'm saying to you, in Africa, we have to avail ourselves to this, to this, that we can study Europe because it's all part of humans, right? But of course, at the same time, you're battling with centering African experience, the experience of living here. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, I actually have one more question <laughs> based on uh, what you just answered. Um, you were saying that, uh, okay, based on the, the, the the ego and the super ego and stuff. How do we, like, how are we as as South Africa or Africa gonna go about incorporating culture into understanding our behaviors, Africans, and not just the Westernized side of, you know, to make people and to, to kind of make therapy like more easier because like if like if. We as, as therapists from the 20th century have information um, that is more on a, a, a African cultural incorporated therapy. I feel like it, it will be easier to, to communicate with the people, especially the, the African people, because like if you sit there and you have your, your client in front of you and um, <coughs> You, you tell them, look, you have this disorder. They won't understand it because they have their own beliefs in terms, in terms of spirituality, as the lady and the gentleman mentioned earlier on. How do we incorporate those understandings of behavior into therapy? Okay. Thank uh, you. I don't, I'm not saying you do this, but I know there's an experience, uh, and I felt it. I'm doing a psychological thing, so I'm sorry. There's a thing there. There's some people who are not black in the in the sense which are oh, what is the problem in saying us Africans? I, I had that bit right, right there. The, why, why is this problem about about excluding you from the category of of, of, of Africans? I know what. in the world. I mean, even the best of us, they know you can't touch it. There are four races. But if you go to Brazil, there are other kinds of people to do yes. But actually, there's only one race in the world. Right? It's the other race. The white people are the other race. The white people are the races. The white people are human, right? Uh, so, this belief that race is actually, there's a covered race. A, this, is a, this is a fundamental uh, era of, of 
of thought, but of course there's a political purpose to this thing, right? There's a political purpose, but ontologically, you have to, you have to take on, you, take, you are, you, being African is being of Africa, you are here. Mm. You have to take this and say, no, 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 start say, don't call me by, by, I want to choose this. Mm -hmm. The really important part about this. <laughs> and so when I talk to, to students who I taught for 11 years, I do that with but even now, that certain people, because they have believed in this idea, that they're colored. They say, no, but colored people don't have the culture. I think, I cannot believe this. I can't, I can't, I can't grasp this. I can never grasp this idea that there will be a people without a culture in the world. Culture is a way of living. It is a way of living with each other. We set rules about how we live with each other. And, and, and these rules become entrenched when we practice them, when we, people always challenge them. Culture is this, is this thing. It's not that. It's not something that comes because I look darker than you. It's not like Africans have more culture because, no. They might have done certain things for a longer time, right? But why people have a culture? I mean, if you think America doesn't have a culture, then you're, you're mistaken. America celebrates American tradition. In a lot, they build buildings to it. And in that culture, part of individualism is part of American culture. To be an individual is part of American culture. But America is so cultural, you can't believe it. You, you walk every street. Washington, D.C. has how many museums right now, right? On the National Mall, they have museums for all Americans. The last one, of course, was for black people. <laughs> black people right? But they put black people closer to the, closer to the, to the tower, that tall thing right there, right? African American. So no, you have to own this. Nobody can, that's alienation, right? That, this is an example of one nation. I can't tell you this until you start believing I'm of Africa, and Africa is, I am Africa. Nobody can take this away, and nobody can, can really make you feel this idea. This is what I'm talking about in class, this, this ethic of care. About let's, when, we're not learning only textbooks, we're learning about ourselves. How we name, this agency, how we name ourselves. So thanks about, about that. And our African culture, I'm going to come back, I'm going to ask, answer, just in a minute, let me answer Neil first to your question in Baba also one about the culture. Uh, you asked me a, an interesting question. So how then do you do uh, complete negation? So you go the other direction in the curriculum uh, of Western psychology, or you reform it bit by bit, right? That's basically what you asked me. Um, I'm just trying to understand what we can do with the information we've already received. Right, right, right. right, right. Yes, and the concept I use, uh, I've used quite a lot. It, it comes from, from somebody as a South African, but it, I mean you can pick it up in different ways in other writers. And this is a, this is a question where I was um, I would end by the way. I'm, you know, let me say this. So if you say, remember where I ended, right? I ended by saying if you have this thesis then, this report, it's great, it's excellent, they've learned something. You can give them zero because you know that's basically saying you, you know this is this is alienation. You, you, you are just mimicking some people. There's nothing original in here. You uh, you fail, or you can give hundred percent or whatever a grade right? because they they've learned. It. Some people uh, um, will say, or I will say, I begin by saying. So Euro-American psychology that is taught here, this thing called, that, that we have learned, right? this Freud, uh, was not intended to, to make, <coughs> well, let's say to overcome inferiorization. It was supposed to, to maintain this superiority inferiority complex, right? Mm -hmm. It was supposed to do that, to alienate yourself, right? So you can become an expert in mimicry. And so when you come in there, they don't teach you to uphold injustice, you know, to be, uh, solidarity with, with people who are suffering somewhere, you know, you don't do that. They, we just channel you to, to become a particular kind of therapist, and mostly it tends to be, if you are a clinical psychologist or counselor, you tend to work in particular with one-to-one, -one, you know, and, and all of that. Um, but one has to go slowly over this. To say then that this African 
psychology that's Euro American oriented, that looks outwards, is, uh, uh, is not meant to de alienate you, make, make you live better here. To say that it's not meant to make you live better here does not mean that uh, a doctoral study like that is weak. See, this is, the, this, is the, this is what we sit together as a, as a group in a, a teacher and students to, to work out then what uh, this new curriculum, this world as it could be. But people disagree, and I come to you, some people disagree. They say, because it ontologically weakens us, it alienates us, it fails us. So we have to get rid of it. We have to start anew. Now, come on, come on. I haven't finished. Uh, it is colonialist, so it injures us. It keeps on injuring us. Mm. And it echoes the fact that Neil, because lives in Africa, has nothing original to say. Okay, what do you say about it? Um, just building on that, I'm thinking of everything you've spoken, this thing of within and without, and basically this individualization of trying to understand who you are uh, as a person right. or as a as and I'm thinking, if you look at the Western side, maybe not the stuff that we've learned at undergrad degree, but if you look at Dr. Viktor Frankl's stuff on logotherapy and spirituality, you look at Carl Jung's stuff on spirituality and art, you have similar things that start recurring, similar patterns to, not only to what you're talking here, but to various other cultures around the world. And I'm thinking if maybe, if English is this colonial bridging language, this lingua franca, is there not something that we can actually have that's recurrent in each culture, such as it's a symbolism or something, that if, if you look at art or expression or something like that, that could bind us all together in, in that way? Right. Uh, whoever's going to, there's a student there for a master that come later. Because he's exposing, but one of my disagree with you. So here's my, my, my addition on that. I agree with the other argument, by the way, that colonialism, you know, to keep on teaching this thing is to keep injuring yourself, basically, cutting his life. Suicide, basically, right? Mm -hmm. You just going through and you, you're gonna have some money and some nice t-shirt and nice car, blah, 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 and you're, really, you're injuring yourself. Um, so, there's something, as I said, ontologically. But what I'm trying to mention is this word, entanglement. Entanglement is a, is a, is a good concept. Look, we are here today. We are here with, with coloniality in us, that I'm speaking about to you in English, is, is part of that thing. I'm in, in this thing. I mean, in this thing called coloniality, right? We are. And so, uh, but how do we, so how do we pass through this transition, this coloniality, to get to the other side? And nobody, you, know, you have touched on something really important that I think, you know, anybody at MU wants to supervise something like me and says, well, uh, how then do we, create where we get to something new. Something new that is currently not yet fully gone, but the old is not there. And it's, not, it's going to take a long while to, to kill it. How do you get to this new person, this new subject, by to be born again, as it were, right? Without killing the old self. Uh, and I'm totally practical. I mean, one can theorize about, about this thing. So this is a very difficult problem, and I don't have an answer. I don't have a full answer, but here's part of the answer. Um, but I think universities, as a whole, and psychology department in particular, have to grapple with it. This is the thing. But first of all, if you start to think that it is possible for me to, to, to die, I have to, to literally die and be born again, like Christian, you know, born again Christians say, I, I, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I really don't know, but perhaps it's possible. Uh, I think the weakness is, is a Manichaean argument of the black and the white, that we're going to move from, the, from black as it were, or white. Uh, into another world. But we have, to, we have to transition right there. And the problem we tend to have, some of us, in thinking about African psychology, and I'm in dialogue here with Augustine Nyon in particular, the problem we tend to, to have, uh, but also other people uh, like Silas Makubeya and, and older people like, uh, I mean, older people who written a while back. Um, I'm thinking of the Ghanaian scholar um, in particular. The, the problem we have is, is uh, that all, no, no, that, that Africa, Africa is a special case. That's the problem. That, 
That becomes part of the problem that we are outside of the world. But as I said, we're internal to the world. Even if we don't make the decisions, the decisions are forced upon us. And you have to make a decision in the very fact of living. And that's one, one, one way to see it. But of course, somebody mentioned Franco. Like, maybe by Polsky too, or somebody. But the, you know, the, that Russian, the Russian, I, I like it because we made that example. He was also grappling with the dominance of American psychology. So he was writing from Russia. He was writing really from Russia about how life looks in Russia. How children learn, and writing against Piaget. And you can take other people, Victor Frankl, of course, writing about meaninglessness, meaning and meaninglessness, and life and in, in that context. So, yes, the more you, you, you start finding that there are allies, there are people who have thought about similar problems outside of the center, but also inside the, as it were, the, the belly of the beast. There are people in there who are trying to do other kinds of psychologies outside of the beast, because this psychology, even in America, alienates a lot of people. Right? So you have to, one has to get away from a Manichaean that, that because I'm black, because I'm good because I'm black. It's not, it can't be true. You're not good because you're black. You're good because there are certain human qualities that you express, and you have to find this. Colonialism has said you're bad because you're black. So, you know, it's, it's a, you, you can't just be going in a different direction with it. And that is a hard task. Baba, what is, what is this thing? Yeah, psychology. There's a little corner of psychology called cultural psychology, by the way. Mm -hmm. The little corner, it is not, nobody actually does it at all. Uh, the little corner of psychology, uh, you know, that's the first thing. Psychology doesn't think of itself as a cultural activity. That's the second part, which is basically what you were saying. Um, what is the fundamental character of psychology? And I've already spoken about this. The, what does, What's the real, is there a real distinction between psychology and social psychology, sociology and social psychology? What's the real fundamental thing? It's about the focus, right? The, well, the way they taught us, the way they still teach us. The one focuses on the individual and society, and the other on social groups, right? And, and like, a, no, really, really, <laughs> really. But th this distinction is important for department, for how, for how universities are organized. It's not about what people learn, it's how we organize the university. You have these departments, and they've grown all over years. There, there are whole universities on social psychology, a whole university on social psychology in East Germany. I don't know why they still exist around that. So they wish to channel. I would think, you know, one has to choose between. Is psychology about behavior, as I said earlier? Is it about cognitions, neuropsychological processes, or is it about, here's the thing, is psychology really about experience? This experience of the self, this personhood, in which is again another sociological concept. You should just bring social psychology and sociology together. In this, it must be an experiment together. Make it one, one thing. In this thing. And if you then put at the center lived experience, for me, it makes much, much better sense. And it's, it's hard because we're working against the whole tradition about what psychology is about. Literally, I mean, if, if you have ever looked at journals in psychology, it's just mind-boggling. You have journals focused on a little tiny piece of, of this experience, right? Mm. A short-term memory. Mm, not when they, they do memory journals. They do cognition journals. They do little bits of, of journals. It's because of this over-specialization, over-development. Uh, and what I have come to then is this uh, impedo. By the way, this has been, this, this has traveled in your head. And I thank you for this. It's about impedo. Psychologists are not we recognize spirituality. And this guy I just mentioned called Augustine Noy, he's a Nigerian scholar, now based in UK. But there's a lot of people in South Africa who have been doing this. Um, I have struggled a lot about, and has written about psychology of religion, he's in the psychology of religion. About how do I incorporate in my own thought, because of being an atheist, at least an agnostic, how do I incorporate the fact that in my lived experience, the people do this. And my mother, my grandmother do this. They believe. And, 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 I, and I don't know how to get around this. I, I am stuck right now because of the, religion is an important part of people's lives. It is, Africa is the most religious continent, right? 90%, I think people say. 90% people are. Uh, so it's a, but religion is not central to psychology. So there's a disjuncture right and, but not just religion, not that, that kind of religion, spirituality more broadly, right? 
that people get healed by dancing. Dancing, dancing heals people, right? Mm. And of course, unless it is taken up out as art therapy or dance therapy, mm. yeah, it's taken up as dance therapy. So, I, I mean, one, one of the ways is, uh, of course, I can theorize and tell you this, but I'm just, I guess, saying to both to Baba but also to people who do psychology and young students is, is look, somehow we've come to believe that certain things are outside of the purview of psychology or in certain disciplines because we are told they're like that. The greatest thing is for us to sit down and say, right, we write a new country that takes that into account because religion is, spirituality is a fundamental part of people's life. People explain what happens to them by turning to ancestors, by turning to religion. And this is a real, this is lived experience, right? And until we've written those books, that take this, that put it at the center of our lives, I guess we will be, you know, still making it something we put aside from, from, from psychology. I'm not satisfied with how I answered it, because this, this, this is not I'm a conversation. I'm not satisfied. <laughs> I'm, I'm also not satisfied. I'm not satisfied with how I answered it. You can take it outside. It's yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So the last, bit, <laughs> the last bit about, about this story, and it, it goes to Paris and Baba. Listen. So I've, I've created this framework. This framework, if I was to lead a department mm. of psychology, I will never lead it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, if I was to lead that, but well, here's then psychology as it exists. Uh, African psychology as it exists right now. Uh, or African center psychology as it exists. There are people who are writing. The majority of people are writing in this and still oriented towards the West. The majority of people are teaching, writing, still writing that they're excluding religion, they're excluding culture. Culture is something that happens outside of psychology. Right? And then there are a few people, three categories, smaller number of people, you can name them, you see them how if you follow your writing, you see how they're writing, maybe in classes, or in the classes because I don't see them, what I do. People are doing more what they call critical African psychology. Mostly they critique Euro American psychology. But sometimes they, they critique structures as they exist. They critique institutions, schooling, they critique, you know, uh, so they, they're using a kind of critical approach in the sense of, at the center of this is power. Power in, in, in various forms. Right? It could be feminists who are critiquing gender, it could be people who are doing psychology of racism. You can, you can name them. And I, and I was showing them uh, at the end. Here they are. This is Garth Stevens, that's Norman Duncan. Norman Duncan is Pretoria, Garth is at Beth. They were in a project called the Abani Archive Project. It started about 10 years, no, more than 10 years ago. No, no, and they did something called the Abani Archive Project. They were trying to do this, this sort of stuff, critical African psychology. Uh, and they were battling with it, with, is, is, you know, with the name African, particularly God, uh, but also the critical. They're trying to do it. And then there are this now, a new thing. This is Shaw Sekesi and Correcta Gonzai. Just started uh, this year, got some money to do decolonial feminist psychology in Africa, trying again to experiment to do this sort of work. So they're more critical. Uh, and then <coughs> I also have been, have been having this in a while. So what I'm telling about comes out of this. So that's the critical. And then they said another version called that what people are doing kind of spiritual work, spiritual, philosophical, metaphysical work, cultural work. You might call it cultural African psychology. This guy I've been mentioning quite a bit uses that work. This, you know, Religion is at a center of people's connections. You have to do, you have to teach people in therapy how this, this works. You see what you name them, they are in there. And then there's one, literally, less than five people. What means something quite interesting, right at the end, you might call it uh, uh, psychoanalytic or psychological African studies. These are people who are just moving between. And I shouldn't manage, it does that. So they employ psychological language to theorize certain things. So they, you know, I think that's an interesting space. A guy called Glenn Adams, has been doing a bit of work. Uh, um, I can mention a few others. Uh, so these are people are literally you can count them who are trying to really disentangle or disalienate themselves from this larger body. Uh, in, these are experiments. This is these are interesting, interesting things. Hopefully they get support from from departmental heads about you know experiments. The last part is Pedro Michal. Are you ashamed of psychology? That you do psychology. <laughs> you are ashamed. Yes. Yes. 
and you are now wanting to shame them. <laughs> no, no, answer. Yeah, answer about it. But I think that there's one answer I know, having taught you psychology. Because psychology classes are big. They tend to be really big. At some university I used to work, I used to do a double shift. Double shift, like a triple shift. I would teach in the morning, teach in the afternoon, and teach a part-time class. So if you're teaching a thousand students, a thousand students, in some cases, two thousand students, you can't ever say it's two thousand and six. It's insane. So they ended up doing multiple choice because of them. That's the main reason. But of course, sometimes it becomes a tradition. Yeah. Rather than thinking, if you can reduce the classes, but you can see the problem is also structural, right? Yeah. Universities can, can't have you teaching 2,000 students. See, it's crazy. If you, if you WC or LMI, I don't know here, if you have 2,000 students in your first day class, they have about 700, and then they have about 300, and then about 20, and then yeah. 9, that 12 that you were talking about. But at UCT or Pretoria, you have 500 and you have 10 lecturers, but there you have five lecturers. Clearly this imbalance doesn't work. Yeah. The students are getting better <coughs> attention, right? And these students are suffering and they tend to be black universities, tend to suffer because of them. But if it becomes tradition, so the university has to come to the party and says, no, if you're going to increase the size of classes, you have to increase the number of people who teach those classes. That's it. And this is what's going to happen, by the way, from this year onwards, right? If you have fees increasing, and if you talk to, 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 the, to the vice chancellors, I ask them, so how is it, go, how is it working? And all of them are battling, right? Yeah. How do you increase the number of students because you have the money? Because you can't only increase students without increasing the teachers. Yeah. That's yeah. it, that's basically yeah. But this is, this is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, this is a question that I think of comments that in psychology we face as lecturers for a number of years. It's not new to us. Um, when it comes to the multiple choice questions or the nature of, of the assessments at an undergraduate level, um, specifically, and it has a lot to do with what Kopano is saying. But if we look at, at our university for this year, our core students who have taken, um, who are registered for psychology are close to probably about 200. Mm -hmm. Just 200. But they'd be servicing the rest of the university as well. And that is where the real, the real problem actually that starts becoming um, apparent for our students who are registered for psychology because they become lost in the masses. Mm -hmm. They really do. And there is something we are trying to tease out by actually capping our classes a little bit more. But the more we cap our classes, it seems that we face with other systems yeah. um, that are coming in place that we just don't have a choice. Um, I had a social psychology class that I taught this year. Um, the, the class list said 600, but when the students actually wrote the first test, it was 1,200. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is because of the late registrations, the students coming in late into the system, uh, funding, etc. So because the universities are open to the struggles of students, um, we also placed in a very difficult dilemma of how do we actually assess our students. It becomes problematic, and I get that an MCQ is not the answer. It definitely is not the answer. And it's something that has been tackled within our new curriculum. There is a new psychology curriculum that is coming to place. It has some of the modules have started rolling out this year, and there are written assignments, there's written tests, there's exams, and there is a small component that is MCQ, but it's not completely MCQ. So there are these slight shifts that are taking place um, when it comes to the teaching of, of psychology, but we are grappled with the same issues of how do we, how do we ensure that there's, there's a single lecturer so, uh, servicing 1,200 or 1,500 students that we're actually making sure the students speak to what it is that you need. It's a huge struggle and it speaks to that power dynamic between what is considered as the authority and how do we bring our students into the classroom as the new authorities. Because each student has a particular lived experience. And unless we are speaking about theory in ways that they can take this back to communities and put it in, into practice, then our theories are failing and that is how psychology has failed up until this point. It really has. So there is a deep acknowledgement about this. Um, and as we are moving forward, we are trying critically to try new things of how do we engage with our students, how do we shift things about. And along the lines, we fail. And sometimes we have some successes as well. Um, but I guess there is, there is where we're at. It's we in this piloting of, of a new system where we, we're not just working from a top-down perspective, and our psych society can attest to that, um, where we're actually involving them a lot more in the decisions that are being made in the department. Um, we have this project called Decolonizing the Passive Ways. Um, <laughs> something very, very, very superficial, but, but very deep. 
Um, if you walk into that, you know, building seven is, as I was saying, very eloquently placed. Um, it does look very dreary and, and you know, dry and, and old and outdated. And the posters on the walls also reflect from 1970s and 1980s. And, and that's all this process that we're keeping alive. Um, so as a, as a society, as a department, we've come together saying, we want to shift and change these things. Just because them the, down. We are, we are. <laughs> but it's taking them down and filling them up with what? Because we don't Just want to relate to what? No, 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 no. We've got to fill up psychology with something new. We've got to fill up psychology with something new. A blank space is not a good space. Yeah. Okay. Okay? So we're engaging with our students to see how do we actually go about um, the redesigning the look and feel of the place. I cannot talk about the number of students that have been accepted based on race. Um, this is a, a problem um, going forward. Given that with the HPCS, if you look at the number of psychologists that are registered, um, there's a real skewing in terms of the racial distribution, and universities have to take a more um, advocacy stance in terms of redressing this. How they're going to do it, I have no idea, because invariably it implies the exclusion of a certain group over the other. <coughs> I have a student, my PhD student, called Sibor Lamin, to a PhD on precisely this question, by the way. Just this question about uh, how it's called recentering Africa in training pro you know, uh, psychology professionals in counseling and clinical psychology. And the debate we have, the, the discussions we have every day with him are, are amazing. About, he was at Rhodes, uh, did, did all his, until, until Master's Rhodes. Uh, including one of the classes where only black students were admitted at Bruce at one time. Yeah. And the problems that they had, what the students, what, you know, what, what is this? I mean, are you experimenting on us or something? <laughs> <laughs> but the debates about precisely about how, who is, who is the ideal professional student psychology is, is immense. Uh, and of course, if you don't have people who are sitting in the side of the room and interviewing you, have you seen, uh, let me tell you if you have more. Have you seen how people do uh, around June to, to August, what happens to other people? They have this cohort of students traveling from university to university, yeah. trying to get a space. It's just, it's, 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 yeah, anyway, or, or people who are, are sitting this side, most of us that don't have questions around spirituality, other questions, so we take the students we think are ideal, and these students, Historically, tended to be, guess what? White females. Yeah. White females are the ideal therapist yeah. in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Nobody says it explicitly, but you see it in the numbers being taken. White men have just grown, gone up in, in therapy. Uh, they, they have some black men and some black, black women, and it's like haphazard. How, how, do you, how do you do it? But they have a formula, they, not, not, a, not a formula, a mathematical formula, but the ideal type of students who become a therapist. And, and it has to change. It has to. I mean, if you, you, it has to, the, the number of taking 12 students, which also, also goes about how many clean spots in the clinic you have, right? If you have a clinic. So you have 12 offices or six offices, two by the office, so that they can share. Uh, fundamentally, it has to change. It, it has to change. The SPC, SPCS has just brought out the numbers. They did a research, they just brought out a report right now. Uh, and I think it'll change because also of the new introduction of the scope, what's called the scope of practice. The scope of practice is uh, this thing called psychological counselor is coming back. It has to come back. Uh, because psychological counselor will take care of a, a, a huge number of mental problems, mental illnesses, which is a four year degree basically. A four year degree that will be in clinics and all of that. And then black people, sh uh, black people in particular, would be less shy to say, well, I'm self, I have an anxiety disorder. What is anxiety disorder? <laughs> no, what is anxiety disorder? It's a, it's a real thing. Ask academics. Academics can't sleep because of anxiety. I have to publish. I have to do three publications. Anxiety is a real thing. It's debilitating. And in this country, is that you have to do just two items or three items of publications, otherwise, you start having palpitations in the middle of the night. <laughs> I think it was a question of the Yes, but I think the point on uh, the ideal candidate kind of answer the question. Because social exclusion sometimes it's like, sometimes we, we don't see it. 
but we practice it continuously until we get to a point where we question it. Because in my experience, what I have seen in another department, at another institution where I come from, it's that you realize that there are people that I consider to be brainwashed. And in the, these are the people who actually don't question the theories that are used in the department. And as a result, they actually manage to go all the way to PhD. But I'm here, I did not even go through because I questioned all those theories. And I even failed for that matter because <laughs> I was questioning the whole idea between um, Franz Fanon and Paulo Freire. Mm -hmm. Because the people who were teaching, they actually believe that Freire is the man. But I actually believe that Fanon is actually the one who taught Freire. Because in one of his books, actually, Freire says that he actually read Fanon and then he reconceptualized. But they denied that. And I failed my thesis and I left. <laughs> so now and I, I, I look at that and I was like, okay, this is actually social exclusion. And I used to be part of something called Abaslal Basem Jondol, which was actually led by <laughs> Nigel Gibson and, and, and Richard Peters and all these other, other, other guys. I didn't know that it was actually funded by the DA, so the DA comrades. <laughs> and I did not know that actually the radicalism that was actually in that movement was actually funded radicalism and it was actually to, to destroy the work of the, of the ANC-led government. Mm. So I led the struggle, I led the struggle until I actually realized that I'm actually a DE puppet, unknowing it. <laughs> but when I started questioning that, my former supervisors and mentors stopped talking to me until today because I was actually now questioning these, these, these uh, uh, theories that were actually now being perpetuated. People thinking that, saying that they are using Fanon, but they were not necessarily using Fanon. It was actually to manipulate black minds. But anyway, that's on another, an, 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 another side. But there is a word that I have a problem with, and I was reading it in a, a psychology book. I'm not a psychologist, by the way, and I'm, I've never been a psychology student, but my mentor actually, my current mentor, gave me a psychology book because I'm doing a study on, on career choices and I'm not using any psychology. So now he gave me a book on psychology and then they say that this is a South African book. But now I have a problem with that book. Almost every page has the word client. And but now when I look at the people that they actually talk about, they talk about poor black students, students and learners in primary and high school who are not paying any money for, for those consultations. And in my, in my understanding, a client is someone who is actually paid. But now I want to understand that why do we keep on using the word client even when we are actually even addressing the people that are not even paying? Is it not one of the Western concepts that we don't want to question in any case? Thank you. There was, oh, thank you. Um, I just want to, uh, perhaps, there's so much to unpack, you know. There's so much work for us to do. Sorry, there's so much work for us to do here. Um, during the struggle against colonialism, the psychology for black people was actually their history. It wasn't, it was the historical consciousness, rather. It was the building of historical consciousness. Um, that was validating for black people the, 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 their own existence, their ontological sense of self. And it is from that that people like Fanon, Migo, and others, Du Bois, really, or Du Bois, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it was on that that those black people built a concept of the, the, the mind. And it was about consciousness. Um, and it shocks me that in a country that has come through 350 years of brutalization, psychology students don't have to do sociology, history, or politics, or any of those things, and that the ideal psychologist is a white, passive-aggressive woman. <laughs> it bothers me that these departments are held with such esteem in the academy. They are basically what anthropology was in the 1920s. That is where they still sit in terms of their understanding of the mind. If you want to understand the mind, you have to go, and it's going to understand the mind, and, and I mean, your work that is really trying to push back is so steeped in an understanding of the histories of the people uh, who have come to be um, negated, right? So, anyway, so that issue around the power of psychology and its ability to determine the, the political language 
must as medical language in so many ways. So if we talk about even struggles, we all when I come, let's talk, I know all about your whites there. Who, who, who fed you a radicalism. Let's talk about the anti-rape uh, struggles at Road, which at the core began to disintegrate because the black condition wouldn't be acknowledged there. And then you had to have the solidarity with white women who, for whom rape became a certain kind of trope and black women who are also protesting two weeks before the rape thing that they were hungry. So you had these mismatches. Um, and then, sorry, so it, it, oh, and I, I, I remember once at Rhodes, we had to deal with black women and their insecurities. And I said, look, guys, I'm from a rural area. And I think you deal with this a lot. In a rural area, bums, hair, and uh, are, are the most important thing, OK? This thing of being hairless um, and, and being slim, as we all know, is a new construct. Mm -hmm. If you as black women can't grapple with that, I don't know what to do with you. Mm -hmm. And so these things, so dealing, so psychology, so, sorry, so spirituality is really the equivalent of what history was doing. It's the conscience, consciousness building that is necessary for coping with the world's issues. Um, in conclusion, I think we must push this work. One of my friends who's an initiate at Goko, as well as a, a drama lecturer at Rhodes, is doing work on Uvalo, Lutualo. That transcends now the black-white issue. We can say to a person, on Uvalo, well, let's deal with you. Mm -hmm. We can ask these questions of the human condition if, and we can begin to break the, that, bin, that binary of, by, by beginning to take our own languages seriously and we can universalize those concepts. We can universe, if we want to understand the abuse of state power in Africa, all those issues come down to being able to say, when I go ten, Uzuma, you still have his tunes, his siriti, but you are messing us up. We must question how you're building siriti, even when you are messing us up, mm -hmm. and how you're going to lose that siriti eventually. The SS tunes. We have to be able to do these things in these departments. So um, the suburbanization of psychology is the biggest problem because our children are, are imbibing the language of individualism even when they talk about their anxieties and Rose had to say of course you're anxious you're in the belly of capitalism how can you not be anxious your anxiety disorder is not pathological but when the white girl wants to be ah, I'm so anxious I'm so anxious I'm like well Becky I don't know what to do with your anxiety because you have a lot of material condition Let's deal with your problem. Come to me. <laughs> but you do know that we must deal with this anxiety. Go to counseling. But you had better finish this thesis because your black condition awaits you outside. Yes. You have to deal with the entire thing. And I want to. I really want your work to really be so foundational for us. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But before I go, I just put your name. I mean, it's lucky. Lucky, yes. Uh, so how, how many, how big is your department? Oh, history is tiny. <laughs> Sociology is bigger. But it, we don't have a large history class for the problems of history has fallen out of favor. Yeah. And that's why I'm arguing that it's interesting that the struggle was about putting historical consciousness forward. But in the corporatized capitalist world of today and in our university, we sell to students, they run to psychology. You know why? Because there's a promise there. It's not the psychology department's fault, but there's a promise that you're going to get something. And yet, mm. our black students are walking out saying, mm. I get anything. Yeah. And then they come to me, sorry, they come to me and Baba and Tawe to, 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 for therapy. So they're not going to psychology school. Yes. Yes. I'm I'm dealing with their black condition and their anxiety disorders and their new problems. Because they're like, you understand the totality. I'm like, of course I do. Of course I do. But I want to ask you this. Sorry, sorry, What did you ask? So, where do you get the support? Let's discuss that outside. <laughs> to say, well, if you're going to do a work on a party, you need a hundred people, you need a lot of people. 
And, and so Norman is now deputy vice chancellor. He doesn't seem to have a time for for all but <laughs> it was I'm mentioning it because of support, right? You have to support each other. You have to think you're not going mad, which is the, the one the one thing that you're touching, touching that you want. Uh, and medical medical psychologist and medical science. I mean, really, I, I don't get mixed up with psychology, psychology as a medical as part of the medical science because it's about power, isn't it? Psychology the center wants the power of the medical sciences. It wants it. It wants medic discovery health to pay. It wants all the medical schemes. It's about power, money, being in the center of, and, and medicine is a powerful thing, right? Med medical doctors are, are uh, the only people who compete with medical doctors are, are mechanics, right? Because we, you don't know what mechanics are going to work. Medical doctors are so powerful, really, that it, you know, you just have your money, basically. They don't even explain stuff to you. Psychologists want the power. They want the power. DSM, DSM 5 translated this version is a huge part of, of this, this, uh, this idea. So, medical doctors. And, and the stuff around roots is, is an incredible part. Now, last part, because all of the stuff is, is quite key. Um, Mziga Azenduna is the head of school at, at the, is a psychologist. I was the head of school, so development, human development, something at Vets. Says the same thing about you know, And this is a, a, a research piece. It says that black women, black women in, in universities uh, who are PhDs, start being therapists. They start, start collecting all of this, these people being therapists without being therapists. <laughs> so all people come from all departments and say, no, I want to do this, but I'm not your supervisor. I'm not your supervisor, I'm not your therapist. And that role is a, is a problematic. It's a problematic because basically burning all the black, black women here. Mm -hmm. you, you, because they come to take care of problems created elsewhere, but also the university. And there's a project, there's a huge project, about 100, 100 black women saying, we're gonna do this. This, this, is a, this is important in South Africa. Uh, black men are, are a different problem, problematic. This is a problem because we, we, are, we have a problem. We have a, yes. a different kind of problem. Uh, but we can talk about it too. <laughs> now, I don't know what happened right then, but I think it's such a pity. If it's if the way you, you laid it out, I didn't know. Well, first of all, the Labasan was in Jordan for TA funding, but I know there were fights there. These are amazing, incredibly fights that I couldn't just get my head around uh, and all of that. And it's fantastic just to hear it from inside, from somebody who was inside. Uh, but that somehow one would get failed. And I, I never quite grasp why a student would, would get to the point of failing, at the point of failing, at a master's level in PhD. It just doesn't, it forms the mind. And the supervisor should defend you against that. That's the job of the supervisor, that you can't get to the point of failing. But also, the way you, you've outlined it, you can't fail on the basis of argument. It's, it's a, it just doesn't make sense. Argumentation can never fail you. I mean, it's an argument. You're marshalling an argument. Here's my argument. This this is a, something wrong, horribly wrong. And, and, and I, you speak about it, but the injury that just happened there is just incredible. You're just speaking like that. No, no, it, it's unacceptable. You can't get to, a supervisor defends you. Care. This is the ethics of care I'm talking about. I'm really learning how to supervise, basically. And I wanted to show you again. Uh, we just had one, so I've been having this, especially from last year, because I have this one of the students, again, another PhD student, and this is what he, who helped me do this decolonization all, all the time. We just had one about who is supervising black students to what end? Mm -hmm. It's a key question. <laughs> who is supervising them? And basically, why are they supervising them? Is it because you want to add your numbers as a supervisor? And I'm talking about both black, black supervisors and white supervisors, right? Mm -hmm. White supervisors, of course, need this you know, to, stay, to stay in the game, right? But black, su black supervisors, you have to have a certain experience of, 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 of thinking about how to mentor, to supervise, right? And so if we don't have this, this training amongst ourselves about, and then hearing how students, the, the, uh, the experience that they have in the supervision, in the, and, and the, the colloquial, it's colloquial, two things, because people say, 
Well, you can talk about supervision both, but you have to talk about mentoring at the same time. Yeah. Because students come to you sometimes, not as a supervisor, mm -hmm. and I had another one who's now a lecturer at U U U UCT, who's fantastic, Marisa Malena. Uh, Marisa Malena would come to my office, and I would say, right, right in the beginning, I would say to her, this, I would say, are you talking to me as a supervisor, or as a mentor, mm -hmm. or as a brother? Mm -hmm. And she says, actually, I don't know. I, I don't know this moment. <laughs> Because she's talking about Hannah, right? She's talking about Hannah, she's talking about her mother, uh, her sister who's pregnant at home. I think this is not part of the supervision, right? Uh, she's talking about the sister who's pregnant, doesn't want to go to school, who wants to live with the boyfriend. She's talking about the mother who's been kicked out of the house. This is, who supervises the students who, who do this to you? And you have to, you have to gather them up, right? You have to talk to them and say, let's talk about this. Let's, let's sit down and talk about this. The ethics care supervision. I see. You have to talk about this. And, and then, after you've done this, okay, let's go to the text. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.